Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, greetings to you. My name is Michelle Sam and I'm Tanakha. I just uh, introduced myself to you in uh, my, my home language. So this, this module is going to hopefully take you full circle. Um, indigenous methodologies, knowledge, relationships, and research is an emerging, absolutely emerging field. Uh, we have many, many scholars across nations, across geographies, uh, internationally as well, doing work in this field, um, uh, looking at our knowledge relationships, looking at our research relationships with Western researchers, all around the same goals, I think, which is to, to positively impact um, life lived well and long, and what does that mean for each of us. And so this set of slides is going to take you through some of these ideas, uh, give you some context to some of the readings that you've done, as well as give you some context for the group activities and your reflections. So I'm the one that's going to be marking your reflections, so think about it um, and uh, let's make it meaningful. My investment in all of this is that um, I am a huge proponent for uh, good research. Research that's useful, use, uh, useful in terms of being valid, in terms of being relevant, in terms of being respectful and responsible. And so it's my invested goal that, you know, sooner or later, maybe our paths will cross and you will have some really positive research that you're working with. So there's some concepts that you might not be familiar with. There's some concepts that are emerging and, um, you know, it's a very short module and uh, we won't be covering everything. And like I said, you know, there's there's emerging scholarship in the field. So it's changing. It's, it's growing. It's generating new knowledge every day. So I'm just going to show you um, a model that was used in my master's thesis and this came out of over a hundred um, interviews with uh, my own people asking them what the perception of the welfare of children meant to them. And so when I asked that question to people and it was a range of, of, um, uh, of ages and stages and you know experiences and I got over a hundred people's life stories and you know, had to debrief with them and had to deconstruct what I meant by the welfare of children because we have had impacts of child welfare. I'm one of them, I'm a 60 scoop kid. And so when I asked them what the welfare of children meant to them, quite often they would start with, well, child welfare is. And it ended up having to unpack that and really understand better what I meant, you know, what they meant by uh, perception of the welfare of children, right? What does welfare of children mean? As well as what I was asking them about, well, what is the welfare of children if it's not child welfare? And so this model in the inside, in the inset, is what we, we recognize that we had a relational identity development um, that these different social infrastructures impacted, good, bad, and indifferent, had influence upon the individual. And we would learn about our lands and our language. We would learn about ourselves as individuals and as nations. We would learn about our belief systems. We would learn about other nations and other people and other non-living beings, which relates back to our belief systems again, our religion. But then with colonial um, experiences, we, we inherited a whole bunch of very interconnected issues um, that you know become sort of like a, a vicious circle around us. And you don't see health named, for example, in this, but health is implicated in every single one of these issues. And these were just the main themes that, that came out of that research back in 1998. And so this is a very specific model to the Tanakha, but in, I've taken it to different nations, different people, and they've all sort of said, yeah, you know what, we have something similar. We see how that's come, come to us now and, and become part of our, our lived experiences. And so I work at the Human Early Learning Partnership and, and um, when Dr. Clyde Hertzman was uh, alive, he, he had just passed on, but when he was still alive, we started having these conversations about the social determinants of health and well-being um, indicators. And so I ended up looking at you know, these issues and this data again and recognizing the social determinants of health and how the social determinants of health are now coming into our communities you know, with that lens on. So looking at our issues now with that lens of social determinants. But we're still coming from the outside in, not the inside out. And so really, it's more of the same. It looks like it might be different, but it's really more of the same uh, attitudes that we've been getting all along since contact. And so 
there's some great resources and you'll find in the uh, in the module that I have given you copious amounts of reading and you know or references I should say and don't feel like you need to take them all um, but it was really challenging for me to say to this group of people I've never met you know what are the quintessential things that you need to read because there's so much diversity in what to read and then there's place-based readings and then there's you know on and on and on so my hope was really to inspire to challenge your thinking around worldviews and hopefully in your first module you will have gotten some some inkling into understanding better your own worldview understanding the cultures that you operate in uh, understanding how you know what you know and then coming to understand how you know that you didn't know. And so I have this little saying, you don't know what you didn't know until you know you didn't know it, right? And it's that moment, it's that aha moment of either a challenge or, oh yeah, you know, you get inspired. And sometimes it's it's an indifference, you know, just, ugh, you know, you can't, you're not quite sure what to do with that information. And so it's really important though to recognize that we all have those different ways of, of understanding and, and perceiving the worldview and in interpreting the worldview. And as you know, medical professionals, you know, a lot of your work is interpretation and it's uh, understanding, right? And then sharing that understanding to, you know, to support and influence um, health in the long run. And indigenous people have the same sort of thing. So I've been looking a lot at what's called the hermeneutic circle. And so this is Paul Duguay's model of um, the circuit of culture. And so he, he talks about representation, regulation, consumption, production, and identity in his work. And he started his work looking at the Sony Walkman culture uh, way back when. Maybe some of you haven't, you know, never had a Sony Walkman, but I did. Uh, we could say now the iPod culture maybe, um, but he was really looking at how that culture got reinforced and uh, actually, you know, started to self-regulate and, and became, you know, you could really see this is a culture, right? You either had one and you understood it or you didn't. And so I see this, um, this model is really, really important in terms of hermeneutics of really, um, you know, putting into action and putting into thought the idea of empowerment. Because empowerment is really about starting from the center, from inside, and, and coming from the inside out. And so we often talk, we want to empower people. Well, that's physically impossible. And actually, it's it's a misnomer uh, use of that word, because the word means, you know, in power. Um, so coming from inside out. And so the hermeneutic circle is really about understanding self, right? And so you see in some qualitative research, you see um, the question often in reports about researcher positionality. And so uh, Moustakis back in, um, oh geez, I guess it was the 80s and the early 90s, he did a lot of work around heuristic inquiry, which is really about, you know, understanding yourself and grounding yourself as the inquirer, right? As the person asking the question, what influences what you want to talk about? What influences who you're going to talk about, how you're going to talk about, and who you really are. And so that's really implicated in this hermeneutic circle. And so what happens in research when we're looking at our own circuit of culture or we're assuming we're is within the same um, normative circuit of culture or the normative culture is that it keeps everything sort of flowing, right? So the, the knowledge starts to reify that circle and it's functioning and it keeps it going for you and it keeps it moving. Um, there's no question to it, you know, we just sort of start, oh, you know, okay, that's the way it is, right? And so we have to recognize that a lot of the work that's been done in Aboriginal health and in Aboriginal, or sorry, Indian problem research, which is the foundations of Aboriginal health, has really actually been a secondary source of data um, analysis, and it's actually created a vicious circle. And so if we think back to 100, 200 years ago, for example, you know, people came to Indian people with a lot of preconceived, um, preconceived uh, notions and ideas, and those have become stereotypes that we have all been socialized with. So, as I said, I was um, one of the 60s group kids, so I was adopted out, and I was raised by Dutch Catholic immigrants. And so, when I was growing up, uh, you know, this very dark little girl with these blonde, blue-eyed Dutch people who were much shorter than I was. Um, there was always an assumption about, well, who is this, you know, what, who is this person with you? And so, 
you know, I grew up with a lot of racism and they grew up with a lot of discrimination because of course English wasn't their first language, but they could blend, right? They could blend in. And so it's really understanding, you know, the difference of culture and how um, things are important, but the way that you might express it would, would be very different. So for example, in my adoptive family, I was raised with the idea that yes, culture is very important. Um, language is very important. Dutch was spoken in the home. Um, you know, homelands was very important. My parents went back to Holland often and family was very important and they would go back to visit family, right? They would continue those relationships. We often had uncles and aunts coming from Holland to visit and cousins that, you know, would come and travel. And so, but we didn't know a lot about me. And so often I was, you know, sort of treated as a backwards, you know, you're backwards and thought of as, well, you know, you're not quite, you're too simple or you're too primitive. And we see a lot of this in our attitudes of, well, why don't you just do this, you know, as Indian people? And why are you, you know, why is your health such a problem? And so it really gets into the issue of values and of principles and of over time of how those values and principles have really become our frame of reference and how we use that in you know, data analysis in our everyday of how we judge people and, and what picture we see of them and whether or not it's a mirror reflection of who they are or if it's really who they are. And if it becomes a mirror re reflection, it becomes a vicious circle because it's very difficult to, to set that right. And so that is purposefully supposed to be backwards on your on your screen there. So if you're looking at it going, hmm. And that's that's the visual representation of what it's like to be in a vicious circle where you know the definitions, it's not making any sense anymore, right? It may have made sense in the first you know, primary source view, right? Your own source view, looking at yourself. But looking outside, you know, it, it starts to distort what you see. So there's an interaction between Western and Indigenous knowledges. And in the reading, uh, Brand Castellano, she talks about it when she talks about Indigenous methodologies. And so this, this little um, visual that I'm going to show you right now is basically the historical relationship has been, you know, Western methodologies have sort of come over and taken over Indigenous knowledges through traditional ecological knowledge, uh, through education, through residential schools, through child welfare, you know, et cetera, et cetera, determining what indigenous knowledge is and what value our knowledge has to ourselves. And so, for example, residential schools was all about our ways were detrimental to ourselves. We couldn't modernize, we couldn't westernize unless we got away from our parents and their influence and their cultural influence to be influenced by Western thought. And so the Western methodologies have, have um, really shaped and reshaped our knowledge relationships for ourselves as well as for future generations, as well as past. So when we think about, for example, uh, you know, doing research and we have an Aboriginal population, and then we suggest that it's a normative Aboriginal population, what are we really saying? Who are the people that we're actually talking about in that research? And how could we possibly generalize between, you know, that that data that you have and then generalize to everybody else, you know? So don't worry if you don't get it yet. So basically what we're doing now as Indigenous peoples is we're separating out Western methodologies. We're not throwing them away. We're looking at them very critically. And there is a movement within, um, you know, within scientific inquiry across the board as far as I'm concerned you know you go into physics you read some of Stephen Hawking's work you read some of you know the big thinkers um, in, in the natural sciences and they're all saying the same thing that the Western methodologies have have been missing things they they're they're useful but they're limited and so science is about generating knowledge it's about you know generating ideas it's about understanding and so to me it makes perfect sense to create space and time uh, to consider indigenous knowledges because those ways of knowing have not been explored, right? So we need to separate out, excuse me, we need to separate out Western methodologies and indigenous knowledges to better to have a better relationship, a more a, a relationship of, of equality um, and, and of valuing differently. And so Linda Smith's work, you may have heard of her book called Decolonizing Methodologies, um, but Linda Smith goes into depth. Uh, if you have a chance to read that, it's uh, Maori-based, and again, a homogeneous Maori base, which is being criticized within the Maori community itself. 
But what she suggests is that there is a process that needs to happen within Western methodologies to decolonize, to, to separate out the, the um, intellectual imperialism and understand better you know, the limitations of Western methodologies to have a better relationship with Indigenous peoples and their knowledges. And so for myself, and this is along the lines of Brant Castellano's work and, and Linda Smith's work and a number of different um, scholars, but in my own work, what I've been looking at is that, that decolonizing methodology is not just for Indigenous peoples, it's for Western methodologies as well. And how we can do that is through Indigenous people generating their research agendas and uh, generating their meaning making. And so we see, for example, an OCAP um, ownership, control, access, and um, possession of data is all around that research, uh, that meaning making. How do we make meaning of that data that's collected? We see in Tri-Council Policy Statement 2 in Chapter 9, you know, that there are, um, it's not supposed to, that, that document is not supposed to override what Indigenous people's ideas or, or pro protocols are for accessing information and research. Um, we look at the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, signed by Canada and the, in the UN, but not ratified yet. But within that, they talk about the free prior informed consent um, and the right to self-determination and the right to, to um, uh, sorry, the right to self-determination and self-definition, um, the right to self-governance, the right to act according to our cultures and our languages and our belief systems and our principles and our philosophies. And that's a lot about meaning making. And so when we think about the ethics and accountabilities, you know, when we think about Indigenous peoples, you know, it, it is complex. No word about it. It is complex and it deserves more time and effort. And so in this module, it's more about putting it on the table to help make it um, accessible to you in terms of why, why it's important to consider these ideas. And so, you know, the big why is around, we are setting our own research agendas as Indigenous peoples. Um, we are engaged, we are building our capacity, we have our own researchers, we have students wanting to learn, and we want our non-Indigenous partners to help us, not necessarily take over, but to enable us, to, to help uh, us criticize what is coming into our communities so that we have good knowledge, good solid knowledge. So somebody said, you know, the relationship to Western knowledge, Western methodologies is about, you know, as big as my thumb, if you can see it. But our knowledges as Indigenous people probably span, you know, my arm in relation, you know, in, in relationship to that thumb. And that's how long, you know, I know our knowledges have gone. And so it's, you know, Western knowledge has something to learn if we've been able to sustain ways. And we're still, we're not assimilated. If we were, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So there's gotta be something to this Indigenous knowledge, right? So we're still here. Okay, so, with my this now this work um, that I'm going to present this last piece of this is um, how we're actually looking at how do we establish research agendas how do we reestablish our own make, meaning making um, and our self determination right and our self governance and these sorts of things in our knowledge relationships considering what the UN declaration says considering what tri council policy statements say including when they're working with industry through and shirk and circ um, and uh, OCAP, looking at going back, you know, almost 20 years to um, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, you know, looking at uh, Indian problem research, the idea of being researched to death, what do we do? And so when we look at normative research um, as we learn it, and this, this column over here is very, is uh, influenced by, is basically coming out of um, how uh, Michael Crotty looks at the, the construction of social science research and basically starting from epistemologies or ways of knowing and then informing theoretical perspectives, methodologies and mix and then you know the methods. So it's very normative because it assumes, for example, that the outcome uh, or that our intent is always the same. It assumes that our ways of knowing are coming from the same place. And so, uh, people like Cindy Blackstock and, and Margot Greenwood, for example, are questioning that, they're challenging that, and they're putting back onto the place, on, onto the, the, into research, sorry, ontologies or the lived experiences. 
and recognizing that all of our lived experiences are very, very different, even as indigenous people, um, even within you know my nation, for example, uh, generational issues, residential schools, child welfare, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You look at the colonial history. All of those colonial uh, it impacts address or, or express themselves differently in, in the various generations. And so you look at the work of um, Joanne Archibald and Gregory Katchke, and they talk to the epistemologies, the ways of knowing, um, how do we know what we know, and then informing the theories. There is no Aboriginal health theory, and you know I don't think there should be uh, as far as, as an Indigenous person, because Aboriginal anything is a social construction from an outside perspective um, or it's a colonial perspective uh, in my in my um, scholarly work and so Maggie Kovac for example is looking at indigenous methodologies where she's interviewed a number of um, uh, indigenous scholars and their relationships to knowledge and, and methodology and of course the methods um, I am a firm believer that uh, all research ought to be interdisciplinary when it's coming uh, to indigenous people and with indigenous people because our lives are lived very interconnectedly or intersectorally if you like that sort of theoretical perspective but very much our lives are not lived in the siloed kind of way that primitivist ideology determines for us and that's the next um, arrow here is really challenging the Indian problem what is the problem basically with being Indian and it's been studied for over 200 years um, the Social Science Research Council of Canada started uh, in part because of the massive amount of research that was being done on colonial impacts upon Indigenous people and in, upon Indian people in Canada. And then, you know, whose ethics are we using? And that's a really good question that Willie Ermine and others in Saskatchewan uh, are asking, as well as Brandt, or Castellano Brandt, um, looking at what's called the four R's of health research, um, Aboriginal health research. So respect, reciprocity, relationships, and um, relevance of the research to us as Indigenous people. And so the primitivist ideology often gets uh, assumes um, theoretical perspectives and assumes uh, that there is a way of knowing that's normative, for example. And the theoretical perspective, for example, when we think of research that's being done on Aboriginal health right now, a lot of this comes from you know that that ideology that there's an Indian problem uh, that there's a problem with us you know as people that's why we got sent away to residential schools that's why we get removed from our communities why we get removed from our families because you know our ways of knowing are detrimental to ourselves is the policy framework and so we go back to our cosmologies or our creation stories because our ways of knowing and our theories and our methods and our and our methodologies and our lived experience come out of our cosmologies, our creation stories. So Richard Richard Atlee, Ovine Deloria, Dennis McPherson, they've all written on you know the role of cosmologies and philosophy in terms of determining who we are as a people. How we self-determine is a is a philosophical question to be answered. And it belongs in research because when we generate research, it needs to be relevant. It needs to be respectful. You know, it's in relationship to some people. It will have impacts on people, even if it's not Aboriginal research specific, or if it's not um, an Indigenous people's research project. And I'll give you the example of um, social epigenetics. Uh, so the work that I do at the Human Early Learning Partnership, we, we work with people that we're focusing on biological embedding of social adversity and of social epi epigenetics. And I told one of the researchers about, you know, we used to say, you know, you make a good decision for seven generations because whatever you do will impact seven generations forward. And that as women, you know, we are born with all of our eggs. Um, sorry, as women, we are the foundation of our nations. And so, you know, as women, uh, it's not a feminism, but it's a matriarchy. It's a matrilineal, you know, thought process around how you, how you are in the world. And so, one of the researchers came back to me and said, you know, Michelle, biologically, you know, we're recognizing, we're seeing results from studies saying that yes, intergeneration, intergenerational transmission of behavior and of genetics is, is actually true. And I said, yeah, of course it is. We've been telling you this for years. 
And he said, you know, he never thought of it. Like he, he heard what I had said. And as soon as he heard this other scientist, he was like, that's what she's saying. And I said, yes, and that's in our creation story. That's in our cosmologies. And so, you know, let that be an example then of how these different sciences can come together if we understand those different scientists, those different um, sciences and what the stories are that they're telling us. And so there's processes that get implicated um, in, you know, first of all, determining our teleology, our outcome, our vision, our purpose, our intent. Why are we studying this? Um, what is, whose interests are being met? Uh, who's going to benefit from, from this work? How are they going to benefit? And so the axiological processes or the valuing of knowledge and whose knowledge is valued is implicated. And Michael um, Hart and Sean Wilson write on axiological processes. And those are really in between. They, they are informed by the creation stories in terms of you know, the values, but then they are also um, process-based in terms of um, uh, addressing ideolo uh, ideologies, addressing ethics, right? Whose ethics do we follow? So as a Tanakhwa person, should I be using um, a medicine wheel model, for example, if I don't actually have the ceremonies attached to a, to a medicine wheel? No, I shouldn't. And to do so would be unethical. If I have ethics approval from the institution, do I have ethics approval for the people? No, actually I don't. And uh, that process to get their ethics would be very different. And so when we talk about relationship building and the Tri-Council policy statement says, you know, research should be done with Indigenous people, not as an after fact of talking then and getting consent, is because we need to understand, and you need to understand, what my vision and purpose is, what my intent is for my life or my people in order to make sure that what you're suggesting you're going to do in research, for example, if you were to work with me, is going to help us get to where we're going or if it's going to be a problem. And specifically for us as Tanakha, our ethic, you know, is about not being a burden, not creating burden for other people. And so our, our activities or, you know, even in my, not, in my research should not be creating a burden for somebody else, regardless of who they are. And so it means that I have to think about then how does this knowledge get used, by whom, how, when, etc. And so there's lots of people around that I have to talk to to make sure that it's going to get used in a, in a proper way. And this is just one example. This is where we're heading, basically. We still do Aboriginal health research because that's what funding gets, you know, that's the way the funding gets. Somebody else determines what these priorities are. And they're very much disease model, medical model based, you know, ideas that come into our communities. And we're saying, yeah, that's true, that is an issue. But then we get these crisis managed interventions which only manage the diseases it doesn't actually address the diseases in a lifelong way. And so we're looking, our outcome is very much about, and I'll show you what our outcome is. Um, this is our vision statement. And this is uh, about 13 years old now. We're in the treaty process and this is where we're headed to strong, healthy citizens and communities speaking our languages and celebrating who we are and our history and our ancestral homelands, working together managing our lands and resources as a self-sufficient, self-governing nation. And those words are being defined by us. That's where our self-determination comes out. So a lot of our work has been around what does it mean to be strong and healthy citizens? What does it mean to be strong and healthy communities? And so we've been looking at, you know, nation-determined, community-based approaches. We've been looking at hermeneutic phenomenology. Right? the ability to make meaning for our own selves and participate with others. Right, We've been looking at our cosmology, our creation story. What does it say about our knowledge relationships? What does it say about being healthy? Is the Western model, the, the definition of health, the one that we want to take on? And we've actually recognized, no, we don't want health the way that Western society has health because it's a lot of it is about management of disease and dis-ease. So we're looking at, well, what does it mean for us to be healthy? And a lot of our people are saying it means to be well. And well means, and then they go on to that definition. So we're putting back together our past. So you'll see in this, in this, um, this, this slide, this is an old pass that we used to use a long time ago to go across those mountains. 
and you'll see and we're basically trying to get on to here and say okay where do we need to go what do we need what kind of information we need so we need researchers to work with us we need the different disciplines to, to talk with us but not talk over us but talk with us and and be not just informing us but to become informed as well so that you understand better how to use your tools to where we're trying to get to rather than where you think we ought to go and so at the bottom of that slide it says tachaz and tachaz is our, our word for that's all for now and we don't have a word for the end we don't have you know we have a continuity so we don't even have a word for goodbye our, our word is awinikit and it means to see you again so awinikit and tachaz here is this module hopefully this is going to help you make some sense of, of the the um the group project as well as your reflection I'll be marking your reflection and um, I'm looking forward to it and I hope that this has been helpful to you and I look forward to maybe one day meeting you in person and uh, I hope this was not too painful um, yeah Tachaz and Awinikit hey